Thank you, everyone. It's a blessing to be here today, to see your beautiful faces and your cheerful faces. And uh, once again, welcome Facebook, welcome, welcome YouTube. We're just so blessed to have everyone tune in and listen to this amazing word, the word of God, the truth. And we thank you for that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and the glory, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to be here, Lord God, in your presence. You tell us where two or three are gathered, there you are in the midst. So just pour out your spirit upon us now, O Lord. Yes, we love and we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Pour it out around this building right now, Lord God, and put a hedge of protection around us. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we bind any demonic spirit or influences that might be present in this building. And we cast them into the abyss. And I ask, Lord God, once again, you just pour out that spirit upon us. Infill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord God. That we might have the spiritual wisdom and understanding to discern this word. That the words that come out of my mouth not be mine, but yours through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We just want all things to be according to your plan and your will, knowing that all things will come together for the good, today and forevermore. And we look, Lord God, the blessed hope. We can't wait for Jesus to come again. Send them soon, Lord God. Mm -hmm. We know the days are ending. These are the latter days. Send them soon. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, let's see where we're going today. Well, today we're going to look at uh, the book of Luke, chapter 15. And it's a very important what we're talking about today. Extremely important. We're going to touch on verses 26 through 30. And the Spirit will take us from there. This is Jesus speaking. In fact, when you go to 25, verse 25, it says, now great multitudes went with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, A great crowd was in front of Jesus. And you know, Jesus was a teacher. He was obviously the Son of God, but he spent a lot of time teaching. You know, he was the way or is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through him. But he spoke the truth so that the sinner, sinful man, he told us he did not come for the righteous, he came for sinners, that they might come to know the truth, repent, and accept him as their Lord and Savior. Now, he goes on to say this. Of course, one thing I just want to add to that. I think some people get confused because they have to understand that even though Jesus walked on earth during this time, then he ascended into heaven, and he told us that he would send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to be with us, after he left. That's one of the reasons why he had to die and ascend. But the message of the cross and the meaning for his crucifixion wasn't given to man until Apostle Paul received it in Revelation, long after his death. So I think people sometimes get confused and they listen to Jesus and they want to focus on the red writing in the Bible and they want to follow Jesus without understanding the whole truth, which is the Bible, and understanding how and what Jesus means when he says these things. Jesus came for one purpose, to pay the price for our sins, to pay the ransom for sin, and free us from the bondage of sin, as it relates to the bondage that Satan legally holds over us. He came to redeem man in that process. That's why he came. The, all the Old Testament points to Jesus coming and performing that act. Now, Jesus is speaking so that we understand and also conjunction with what revelation he personally gave Apostle Paul as to what he means and what we have to do in order to follow him. So he goes on to say now, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and child, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Well, I think hate is the wrong word in translation. Right. 
really what he's trying to say is, if we prefer something other than Christ, we have our heart. One thing sits on the throne of our heart. It's the most important thing in our life. What sits on the throne of your heart? That is the question we have to ask ourselves. What Jesus is saying, he wants to be the one thing that sits on the throne of our heart. Now this may appear to be an alien concept to most, because if we're in our flesh, our sin nature being part of or from the flesh, we may not agree with that. We may see that as something we just can't accept. And there's a lot of people, maybe even some, some people in this room, who cannot accept that teaching. But this is not something that Jesus can concern himself with because he's speaking the truth. And it's up for us to receive it or to not receive it. So he's saying that he wants to sit on the throne of your heart. Nothing should become before him in importance. And this is one of the requirements that has to happen if you want to come after him, if you want to follow him. If you don't, you cannot be his disciple. And now some people may say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. My children come first. He's not saying that your children should not be important to you. He's not saying that your children, you should not love more than anything you know in your worldly life, so to speak. They're your responsibility. You have to love them. They're part of you. They're a gift and a blessing from God. Certainly you will try to protect them. You will do anything for your children. But the one thing that you can do most for your children is to put God on the throne of your heart and have a correct walk with God. Amen. And through the blessing that you receive from that, that blessing will be afforded to your children. We can't protect our children from this world. Mm -hmm. The only thing we can hopefully do is have the full anointing of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and whoever's around us receive that anointing and also know that through our walk with Christ, our children will be blessed and should they have an untimely death, the parent can sit there and know in their heart that they have gone home to see the Father. And they are not suffering. And as my wife said, they might possibly be motivated to get closer to the Lord so that they know they can be with them in heaven. Mm -hmm. This is temporary. We focus too much on our circumstances and conditions in the here and now. This is temporary. There is eternal. Our spirit and soul will go and live in eternity. We want to have a glorified body so we can be in heaven with our children for eternity where there are no tears. It's not a fallen world there. There are no tears. There are no sorrows. Mm -hmm. There's just joy and peace. That's the goal. We certainly won't want the second resurrection and get a physical body and end up tormented in the lake of fire for eternity. We don't want that for ourselves. We don't want that for our children. So Jesus is saying, don't discredit my love. Understand my love in that while we were still dead in our trespasses, working against God, he came down and sacrificed his own life for us on the cross. Went through the shame, the humiliation, the torture, all of those things. While we were still rejecting him for what? Because that's how he showed his love for us. That's how God shows his love for us. He sent his son to do that for us. Mm -hmm. Why? So we can be redeemed back into the family of God. Mm -hmm. And he's not trying to antagonize people by telling them that he must sit on the throne of their heart. He's giving them God's prescribed order as the son of God, telling them this is what you need to do. And I guarantee you, if you do it, you won't be sunk. And you won't stop loving your children any less. And you won't protect them any less. And you won't do anything less for them. You actually bless yourself and afford your children more blessings upon them. And whoever does not bear his cross 
and come after me, he cannot be his disciple. People don't understand this. They, they don't get it. By bearing your cross, that doesn't mean you have to suffer to please the Lord. Scripture never says that, and this is the problem that we have because the enemy, and, here's, and this is why I prayed for spiritual wisdom and understanding that we might receive this word clearly. You need spiritual wisdom and understanding to receive this world, word. Excuse me. You can't be in your flesh all twisted up and whatever and think you're going to understand this. This is going to be foolishness and nonsense to you. It's not going to make any sense, mm -hmm. and you're going to disagree with it mm -hmm. because it goes against your flesh. But as human beings, as a man, we have to understand our condition. Our condition is we have a sin nature, and we need a Savior. Now, when the Savior comes, and he atones for all of our sins, past, present, and future, and now, how are we saved? What does it mean to bear our cross? Mm -hmm. We're saved by faith in what he did on the cross. Which means that because he did that on the cross, we don't have to suffer the penalty for our sins. Mm -hmm. He did it for us. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is put faith in what he did, knowing that that took care of what should happen to us. He did all the work for us. We just have to put faith in it. That's all. So it's not about suffering for him. It's really about resting in him from our works after we focus our faith on the work he did. It's a finished work. The victory has been won over sin, over death, over the world, over the, all the demonic forces, Satan. If we put our faith in that, we have victory through our faith. So when we bear our cross, our victory comes from our faith in what he did. That's bearing the cross. Doesn't mean you go out and suffer and do all these works to try and please God. That's ridiculous. But though some people believe it. So when we put our faith in what he did, that's bearing your cross. Okay? We now walk in victory. Our faith justifies us. We're found not guilty. And because of that faith and justification that comes from the faith in the cross, we have victory over sin. And that's how we have our victory. Not by suffering, but through our faith in what he did. We have victory over death, sin, everything. Does it always materialize itself in this fallen world, this visible world that we live in? Why does it appear that a lot of Christians are suffering, yada, yada? Everyone is suffering. Everyone in this world is suffering at some point for some reason. Everyone in this world will have to suffer the one thing we're all afraid of, death. The only way we can overcome death is through faith in what Jesus did. And go to heaven instead of the lake of fire. So when you really look at this whole thing and understand it from a spiritual, spiritual standpoint, spiritual understanding and wisdom, you start to receive these words because you're not thinking in your flesh. You're thinking in the spirit as a believer. And that's the important point. Now when we go to verse 28, we'll see that for which of you intending to build a... No, excuse me, not that one. I want to go to verse 31, I'm sorry. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down and first consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? We have to understand one thing. We are in spiritual warfare whether we want to be aware of it or not. We are fighting all sorts of demonic forces in the invisible world. They're there, they're present. In fact, a lot of the battles that we fight on the world are prior to the fight here. They're fought in heaven. In fact, all of them are fought in heaven. So we're in spiritual warfare. It's against Satan. And all Satan and his demonic forces are trying to keep us under the bondage of sin. Keep us under his authority. 
His end game is to get us to renounce our faith. But his one thing he'll settle for, which is almost tantamount to renouncing our faith, is to take our faith off the cross and put it on something else. Once we take our faith off the cross and put it on something else, and I don't care what it is, we're now creating our own religion. God will not receive it. We're under the control and authority of Satan. We're in our flesh, whether we know it or not. In fact, some people would rather stay in their flesh. They are more comfortable in their flesh. This is why man's religion is so appealing to them. It appeals to their sense of contributing to the process, of having some control. This is me and the Lord fighting the enemy. No, it's not me and the Lord fighting the enemy. The Lord doesn't need our help. He already defeated the enemy. The victory was won on the cross. I know this gets a little redundant, but it has to be redundant for it to sink in. The victory is won on the cross. All we're doing is living in this world, mm -hmm. being bombarded with spiritual warfare. The only thing we're called to do is to minister the message to other people and thereby bring more people into the family of God. That's us serving God. God doesn't serve us, we serve Him. But well, what do we get out of that since we're serving God? Well, who's going to help put bread on the table and feed my family and take care of the work I have to do and drive my wife in and protect this and do it? Who's going to do all of that? We sit there and say, while we're sitting in the flesh. Well, guess what? This is what God said when he said, you know, if people worried about getting fed. And he said, look at the birds and, the, and, the, and whatnot. They're fed every day. God's going to provide what we need. You may not be able to wrap your head around it. You may not even trust it. It's very hard to sit there and be inactive, so to speak, from a worldly standpoint, and trust God to believe that, well, he's going to provide everything I need. Well, I'm the one that gets up and goes to work. Well, who woke you up this morning? Mm -hmm. Who got you that job? Well, I applied for it, and I did this, and I did that. You see? You're on the wrong plane. You think you're in control. You're not in control. Who gave you those children? Well, my genes, my wife's genes. Well, who sent you your wife? You can go on and on and on. If you want to take credit for all these wonderful things that are happening to you in your life, go ahead. Take credit for the bad things too. Reject God and see what's going to happen. What we're trying to say here is, is that if we just rest in Him, God's going to provide everything we need. You got a problem? Guess what? Go to the cross. Remind yourself of what Jesus did on the cross. Remind yourself that that work solved every problem. It's the answer for every solution that you need. All you have to do is what? Have faith in it and rest, and wait. Now, if you want to take matters into your own hands, go ahead. But I guarantee you, you're going to be stressing out. You're going to be worrying. You're going to be all twisted up. You're not going to be happy, and you're not going to have God's peace. Mm -hmm. Now, if I or someone else chooses to do the opposite, and trust me, it's not easy because our flesh always wants to jump up and take over and matters in their own hands. In fact, the hardest part, and you have to understand this and realize this, is, is that before you speak, before you make a decision, because I'll speak, answer people's questions, I'll make decisions, I don't even think about asking Jesus what to do. But I'll tell myself, well, I'm not even thinking about it, and there's not enough time. What am I going to do? Take time and ask them random little things. I go go to the bathroom. Do I ask them if I can go to the bathroom? Do I have to pray for it? I'm not saying that you can. Maybe you should. My point is, before we speak, we need to just pause for one second and ask Jesus. Jesus, give me the anointing of the Holy Spirit and tell me what I'm supposed to say. Or should I just be silent for a while and rest in you even more? 
you know, before we make a decision on what job offer we're going to take, how we're going to respond to a difficulty of job, how we're going to respond to a disappointment in life, before we just jump up and take matters into our own hands because we're used to doing that, just pause for a minute and ask God. And go to the cross first. When you go to the cross, you will essentially deny yourself. And yes, we do need to deny ourselves first. We have to come to Jesus in denial of ourself and ask Him and put our faith in what He did. And that's why we're asking because we know He has the answer because of what He did. So now, what happens is, let me go a little bit further. Now, most people in the world will, like I said, let me go to the next verse. So we're talking about the king, and he's going to sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men, he's able to defeat someone else with 20,000 men coming against him. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. You see, this man analyzed the situation using his own power and his own will. And he looked at 20,000 versus 10,000 and looked, did the math and said, you know what, I need to send a delegation out there see if we can have peace first. This is the world's way of approaching spiritual warfare. Unfortunately, the modern church has done the same thing with the world. No one thing. We are supposed to be separate, separated and consecrated from the world. We talked about that earlier today. The modern church has made a peace treaty with the devil in the world. And they have adopted many of the practices of the world. They've certainly taken man's faith off of what Jesus did on the cross, and they've put it in making money, humanistic psychology, technology, you name it. Man has placed his faith in all these other things, not saying they're bad in and of themselves, but once again, we've got to circle back around. Our faith is supposed to be in Jesus and what he did on the cross, period. And then we rest in him and ask God, have communion with God what to do. So, the peace that the religion as we know it, that it has made with Satan, it's a false peace. You know, their faith has been displaced off the cross. God is not going to receive it. And there will be a consequence for it in this lifetime and possibly in the next Verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. What does it mean to forsake all that we have? Well, when you think about it, the world says what? Accumulate as much as you can. Make sure you have a house. Make sure you have a home. Make sure you have a job. Make sure you have six months of savings in your bank account. All these, you know, wonderful worldly things. And I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but if your faith is in that, and it's not on what Jesus did on the cross first, you're going to have a problem. Right. I choose to put my faith in what Jesus did on the cross, and that doesn't negate the Holy Spirit while I'm resting in Christ and the Holy Spirit is needing me. He's not telling me to take all my money and, and go put it on the lottery or go to the casino and play and, and play for that. He's not telling me to do that. The world says gather everything you can. And our victory in Christ tells us to forsake the ways of the world. Because the world is dying and decaying. The world is full of sin. The world thinks it's going to create utopia through man's religion. Does it look like we're going towards utopia? Mm -hmm. Does anyone think, like we said this morning, with what some of the things that are happening in our schools, more people want to homeschool their children, 
talking about, well, you might believe the, the vaccination isn't for you. Maybe it's a test of your faith, whatever your case may be. I'm not saying the vaccination is bad. I think it's a good thing. But it's a personal decision. But my point is, if you're not vaccinated, you can't go, you can't go to sports events, you can't go to bars, you can't go to restaurants. Well, aren't those the things we're supposed to be separating ourselves from? Worldly things? Mm -hmm. We're being called as a remnant to focus our faith on one thing, and one thing alone. What Jesus did on the cross. We're being called as the remnant to separate ourselves from the world. We're being called as a remnant to get on our hands and knees and pray for the world. We have the precious blood of Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. And we have the Word of God. That's all we need. That's all we need. And we're being called to be that remnant to do these things. And to not worry about anything. Focus on resting in Christ. The Lord will lead us through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Follow that anointing. And you'll have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You'll be an overcomer. You'll be victorious in life. And you'll be pleasing to the eyes of Jesus. And you'll be reciprocating the love that he gave us by being obedient to his word through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.